Welcome back to the programme. Well, in the second half of Arts Alive Music, we're going to speak with an expert clarinet player and repairer. His name is Andrew Roberts. Andrew, thank you for inviting us to your marvellous workshop here. It's a real pleasure to meet you again. Thank I haven't you. seen you for quite a few years, but we worked together for many years in the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, of course. We did, when did you start with the orchestra? I started in 1979, when my teacher at the time, John Fust, invited me in to play um, doubling second clarinet in Beethoven 9. And it was quite memorable because I remember it was the first occasion that Bryn Terfell had appeared. Was it really? And the, every, I think everybody's head shot round to have a look behind to see where that voice was coming from at that point. I went to study for a short time in Switzerland. And then I went over to America to study with Larry Combs, um, who was the principal clarinet in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And it was really through Larry that I got to meet uh, what was my future employer for a time being, uh, of LeBlanc. We were the clarinet manufacturer in LeBlanc. Um, uh, Larry had developed the instruments which I still play on with the team at LeBlanc and he introduced me to the designer and the acoustician there is Tom Ridner, who's a, a well-known name in the clarinet world. And my sort of interest in clarinet development and making of instruments came from that really. What is unique about you, as well as being a top professional player, you're also a fantastic repairer, modifier of these wonderful instruments. There can't be many people who do that. No, there aren't. Um, as far as I'm aware, I may be the only one in this country. I don't know. I wouldn't like to make a, a statement that's, that can be disproved. But I, I don't think there is anybody else in my situation exactly. Um, I enjoy the work in the workshop enormously because I, after 30 years of playing an instrument... One tends to have seen the repertoire a lot, so it's very nice to tax your brain in a different way and just to make it work in understanding the acoustics and the engineering side of things, which I didn't have a lot of experience in, but I've had enormous help from some useful friends. Um, my best friend, Willie Simmons, is, is a, an outstanding flute maker and a, a fantastic engineer, so my engineering knowledge has really come through him mostly. Um, and it's led me into some very interesting things. My work with LeBlanc um, used to consist of doing workshops and presentations about the instruments and how different it was. And one of the major issues for LeBlanc was, was the quality of wood. Um, and in demonstrating that, we could quite often take along a selection of these pieces that you can see here, which basically show you the processes in the change from the original piece of wood this is mostly imported from Tanzania. It's African blackwood or grenadilla. Um, it gets called all sorts of things. Ebony is not quite the same thing, but it looks like ebony wood. Very, very dense, very heavy. I mean, I'm sure you can feel the weight of that. Oh, my goodness. Bit, so you have surprise. Well, compared with the finished yes. item, that is Precisely. a colossal weight. So oh, all of that material has to be taken away. It's difficult to work because tooling will go blunt very quickly because the hardness of the wood is, is such that you have to change these things regularly to make them work. So in the process, we're going to remove, as you said, from the oh, outside... Oh my goodness, what's, what a difference already. Exactly. This has got a flaw in the wood, which is why this has been rejected, and they haven't even made the internal changes. This mould is then the next stage on, where the hole is right through the bell. And then, of course, we're going to get to the refining stages where this is very near to the production, end of production model. And you can see now how much lighter this is. Oh, my goodness. It's a fraction of a the weight. A fraction of the weight. A lot of wood has been it has. taken away. Goodness. And that wood, sadly, the only purpose that most manufacturers have found for it is burning. Um, so they would literally set fire to huge <laughs> piles of the uh, ends, and, ends and middles of the clarinet. Of course, when it's finished, the wood is highly polished and darkens quite considerably, as you can see. From I was surprised, that Andrew, that. because I've always seen the, um, the wood that the clarinet's made of as being almost black, and I'm surprised to see how brown it is. It is actually very brown, and it does vary quite a great deal between one piece to another. Some of my barrels have turned out very, very light, and some have turned out quite dark. 
Well, I know another thing that's terribly personal to, uh, especially clarinet players, but it seems to be woodwind players generally, there's always one little topic that they all talk about. <laughs> now, flute players always talk about head joints. Mm -hmm. And string players talk about strings, of course, yes. and bows. But I know clarinet players, the barrel is the most important thing that they seem to talk about. What is it about barrels that is so important? Well, we seem to have more problems than just the barrel. We also have a mouthpiece and a reed, which gives us other topics to talk of. Uh, but for my purposes, I don't make mouthpieces, but I can make barrels, and have been doing so for about a year now. Now, is this bit below the mouthpiece, the barrel? It's the bit that connects the mouthpiece to the body. And we've got some examples here which we could have a look at. This is more of a standard sort of shape to a clarinet barrel. The original ones usually have a metal ring attached. Oh, like yes, this. that's what I've seen before. Now, this is for strength. Um, unfortunately, there is definitely a downside in that it affects the sound. It restricts the sound. So many manufacturers now, including me, will not add the metal to the, to the, to the uh, wood itself because we've found ways of strengthening the wood on the inside. Obviously, some of this is what we might call trade secret. Um, but we've had some interesting experiments with the different shapes of a barrel. This came from the fact that initially when we start with the piece of wood as a cylinder, which we may see later on the machine, on the lathe, we found that the original shape was sounding really good. As we took material away, something changed. It was just not as good, not as resonant. It really affects the sound. It certainly does. Now, I think Goodness. my opinion is that it's in terms of keeping the energy within the tube that this extra reinforcement, for example, although this is a different colour wood, this is a, a very different size to this one because it's maintained the wood at the higher end as well. And although it looks slightly odd, I have found that the sound quality is so much better. It stays in tune better because it doesn't get sharper going up in pitch as you're playing on it. So we found... Through experimentation, many variations of sizes and designs that these have good qualities. But the best of the lot was when this barrel looked rather large and attached there. That is big. <laughs> it is big, yes. In this case, I think size matters. So it seems to be a good hand type shape there. I like the, the, the feeling of that there. You've got a good grip on the instrument. But it is because it retains the sound quality, it retains the tone, it holds the dynamics, and it holds the pitch better than anything I've tried so far. You started working in this sort of field because of something that happened to you. You, you're, you're a consultant now for the British Association, is it? Performing Arts Perf Medicine. Performing yes. Arts Medicine, and that was for a very special reason. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, unfortunately, in being a, a touring musician, one of the dangers is that you will be on the road a lot more than normal people would be just getting to and from work. I was regularly commuting to Leeds and back 150 miles per day just to get to work. And on a return journey from Leeds one day, unfortunately, I was the front end of a, of a, a pile-up and suffered quite a lot of injury, which was almost at the point of terminating my playing career. I was very fortunate, came in touch with some very useful and helpful people in the medical profession, and they got me back to playing after five operations to my shoulder and an injury to my jaw, which was a very significant part for blowing the crown out. I was very lucky because I came in contact with one of the doctors who works for this organisation, BAPAN, and he happens to be now a godparent to my children, so a very close friend, and he was enormously helpful with me and got me through a very difficult period of nine months of, of, of problems uh, playing. He then made the introduction from me to BAPAM uh, to, to work with them as a consultant because some of the things that I developed um, for my own playing um, also would help other people with problems, whether it's RSI or epicondylitis, those sort of injuries. We can ha offer some help by modifying the ergonomics of the instrument and changing perhaps the thumb rest. Might be a moment to look at that on this instrument here where this is a... 
uh, a non-standard thumb rest which allows me to support the instrument in a, a very easy way where it's balanced and there's no tension. This is one of the main causes of problems, too much tension. I suppose if you think about it, a clarinet is made to a standard pattern, but people aren't. That's exactly the point. What we need is a way of customising and changing things to suit the player, whether it's adapting perhaps a key like this, where this will fit the player's hand much easier than the standard key. And very often younger players, for example, can't reach the hole at the bottom of the clarinet there, which is the largest one, uh, because the thumb rest is forcing the hand too low and it's, it doesn't allow them to cover the hole easily. So certain things like this can be very easily adapted to the standard design and most people find the improvement is comfort and being able to play for longer. And so all this has come really from your own efforts to make it easier for yourself. Precisely. And those developments have now gone on into the instrument design and the instrument's uh, tuning, the acoustics and its performance. Um, I work now to make everything as easy as possible and as, uh, as, with as little restriction to what I do and try to give that to other people as well to experience what it's like to play a very easy blowing instrument which does everything that it should do. Thank you.